Hey everybody, this is John Paul Dumont, the game director for Return to Moria, and uh, I'm really excited to do this. This is uh, the beginning of us uh, just sort of seeing how we can uh, be more engaged, uh, talk directly to everybody in the community, and and uh, just discuss when we when we um, do things like these blogs. So this is kind of our first try at this, and and see if this is something that people like and uh, and get something out of. So thank you so much for showing up. Uh, my name's uh, Eric Livy. I'm the director of production for uh, Return to Moria. Uh, I'm also very excited. I love seeing uh, all the folks here. So thank you for for joining. I'm very excited to talk about orcs today. I'm Michael. I'm uh, the systems design guy on Moria, and and yeah, really excited to be here. Don't sell yourself short. You're creative director. Creative director and systems design guy. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jeannie. I'm the lead gameplay engineer, so I spend a lot of time working with uh, the systems guy, and I spend a lot of time with the orcs, so I'm very excited to be here and talk about them with you. Hi, I'm Ty. I'm the lead character artist on Moria, and I've spent a lot of time working with everyone here, um, and super excited uh, to be here talking with you guys. Uh, I suppose, like, in case anyone doesn't know me, I'm Claire. I'm the community manager. You'll usually see me on the, the members list, list on the right-hand side of Discord. Um, and I'll be fielding questions in the side. And also, one last warning before we get into the, the kind of the meat of all the topics is that there will be spoilers. Yeah, uh, so one of the things just to, for everybody, we've we've absolutely, we are in the Discord, we're watching and reading. Uh, thank you so much for those of you who post into uh, the customer service channels, the feedback and support channels. Um, we're, we actively look at those, we talk about them uh, all the time. Um, you know, we're, we're continuing to review all of the feedback and the bug reports that you send in, and we're, we're continuing to work. You know, it was so fun to ship the game, to get it out on the Epic Game Store uh, in October and then PlayStation 5 in December. We got a couple of good patches out right before the holidays. Uh, everybody on the team really needed a little bit of a break, and but we are warmed back up again and going. Um, we're actively working on the Xbox version, uh, and we're working on a lot of, I think, really cool updates. Uh, in fact, we have a team play test later today for uh, the next update that's coming out. Uh, we're not ready to talk about those yet. Uh, so I know that that's probably uh, for people who are really hoping to find out what the next update is going to be. We're going to be talking about that a future time when uh, when we've got a little bit more that we can we can show off rather than just talk about it. So that's coming. Uh, but we're, we're here, we're working, and uh, we've got some, I think, some pretty exciting updates uh, coming pretty soon. And um, yeah, so the the other thing I want to mention is today, even though this blog was written by Bradley, our art director, um, he is on a, a much longer vacation. He put in a hero's amount of work to make the game look as, as great as I think it looks. Uh, so he wasn't able to be here with us today. So we're going to be talking about his blog post and using it as an opportunity to just talk about all things orcs. Um, yeah, Claire, did I miss anything? I think that was most of the stuff we wanted to start with. Um, yep, I think that that's everything. If you want to jump into discussing the blog, yeah, yeah. So um, some people might have seen the the blog already. I think what Claire you posted yesterday um, or this morning. Uh, this morning, this morning. So it's, very, it's very fresh. Uh, so with um, with the orcs, you know, one of the things uh, that Bradley starts right off and talking about is um, how. How little Professor Tolkien actually describes the orcs. You know, we we went through and we poured through the books. Um, uh, for people that don't know, one of the things that we did was a book club, um, and the whole team went through and read read the books. Uh, we we did two book clubs and probably read through. I mean, I obviously I'd read it a bunch, but um, read through and really poured through each one and. Each time we read through, we were like, just look for anything about the orcs that would be interesting. Make sure that we're, we're really lore, lore forward on them. Uh, and it was kind of amazing how little there was in terms of description uh, of the orcs. There's a couple things every once in a while, but um, uh, he had a very different style than I think a lot of the fantasy that you read now. So one of the things that we had, so then we had to kind of work our way through what do we want them to look like? Because you know, one of the f interesting things about making an adaptation of Lord of the Rings now is that we can pull sort of straight from from the books, but so many people have an expectation 
of really everything from Lord Rings. Um, I have an expectation of really everything from the Lord of the Rings, uh, from movies and other interpretations. And so finding finding something that felt really true to what people expect from from orcs but also feel like it's our own twist and works with us um well, and if i may one of the things that, yeah. that was interesting in reading bradley's uh, blog was that just at least in professor tolkien's mind there really wasn't a difference between goblins and orcs yet we think about them as different so i'm curious like just was there gameplay implications to like differentiating those john paul or or michael yeah, that's a great question. He, he, Professor Tolkien does, uh, if, if you take a very literal interpretation of what he wrote, uh, and then you look at his letters, goblin and orc is really just a different word in different languages for the same the same creature. And so, but for us, you know, Genia Michael could probably talk about this. Um, it, it's become a bit gaming shorthand to separate goblins and orcs as just it's we find it's important to be able to label something so if a player is playing the game and sees a little one they can say oh that's a goblin and they see a big one and say oh that's an orc and an even bigger one say that's an uruk even though those distinctions in the in the books are a little bit more vague so i don't know if michael and Jeannie, you want to talk about that yeah yeah i mean i think it is definitely a li we we leaned into more modern perception here but you know, for a game, you want that small enemy, medium enemy, and big enemy. And so if we had just kind of flattened it across the board, I think that would have made the game a little bit more flat overall. And we wouldn't have had been able to have those big hordes with all the little squishy one-hit goblins all the way up to uh, the dangerous Uruk. Yeah, and Bradley even talks in his blog post that pretty early on we decided to go with that. Uh, distinction that people are used to, both from like the art perspective of being able to give them different silhouettes, and the gameplay perspective of being able to treat them a little bit differently and give the game more variety, both visually and gameplay-wise. Um, and I, he's got some great concepts in there about the different uh, ones that they try out and how they look. Um, and that's a lot of fun. I definitely recommend looking at those. Yeah, one, of, one of my favorite things in the game is when a horde comes on and you know you've got that first wave of the horde or the little squishy guys that I can just one hit kill. Uh, it makes me feel very, very powerful, even in the early game. But then you kind of go, oh, this is easy and bring on all these hordes. And then by the third wave, you're kind of wondering uh, what you got yourself into. Yeah, just looking at the chat too, like, uh, Rookie, well, well, I love the idea of uh, growing pits. Our orcs come out of the ground or from the ceiling. <laughs> That's true. That's how they, they show up in the game. Uh, that That is an interesting one. You know, the team really, we really debated, um, you know, one of the things that was important to us was to not just take our own interpretation of Tolkien's work, but to bring on experts. And and so we had a variety of different experts we talked about, and we we often debated how much of orc life do we want to show uh do and i think we came back to how often professor tolkien talked about them as being evil they were evil creatures and so we felt like to add in a bit of their their life or how they reproduce uh it would have been it sort of crossed our line for how much we were willing to just invent uh since the professor had didn't didn't truly really describe it um, in in the core Lord of the Rings books. So we decided to avoid that. And we also, um, uh, as enemies in a game, you can start to kind of talk about like uh, dwarves and orcs. They've, they've really hated each other for a very long time. So it uh, in the, this game is so much from the eyes of a dwarf. It's not, you know, we try to think of it as everything we're depicting is as if a dwarf went home, uh, and by a hearth described what just happened. And so uh, everything is from the dwarf's point of view. And we, we feel like as described in the books, the dwarves would not take a um, nuanced view into the lifestyle of the orcs. Yeah, and as a AI engineer, I tend to get a little bit attached as I'm working on them. And John Paul, you've told me a few times, like, the orcs are evil. Do not get attached to the orcs. There are no sympathy for the orcs. And so we definitely try to make sure that we keep that accurate and they're evil and they're the bad guys and doing lots of things to make sure that they stay evil bad guys. Yeah, we had that the same challenge with the big bad in the game too. 
how do we tell the story of who this is without uh, people feeling like they feel bad for them? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting uh, line to, to work on because they're they're clearly evil, but you want to sort of give a little bit more life to them. So one of the things I really appreciated was the the banter as they're doing patrols or just out in the out in the world. Like they they start talking about other orcs and and things like that. That was the slice of life thing, but still kept them evil, right? Yeah, and you also like in any kind of game like this, you want to you're going to be able to come upon them b- before they see you. So what are they doing? And that's an area I think that we want to continue to to flesh out. Um, so pulling a little further down, when we get into the the concerning orcs, um, you know, one one thing that Bradley says in here, which is not necessarily about orcs, it's similar to the we wanted to continue to think of the orcs as unambiguously evil. Um, there is something really interesting in here that he mentions, which we did talk about a lot, which is how often um, you know, the elves are sort of depicted as pretty much all good. Um, you know, obviously if you get into the Silmarillion, that's a little different, but in the, in the core trilogy, all good. Um, but the dwarves are, are an interesting one because he does actually describe them as having vices and, but also virtues at the same time. And that's something that I think John Reese davies talked about w- when we were working with him about w- why do people gravitate towards the dwarves? And what is it about the dwarves as a contrast to orcs? And because we don't contrast the evil of the orcs with all good of the dwarves, you know, the dwarves are a bit of, you know, they can be greedy, uh, they can be heroic, um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk a little bit about why why they like dwarves uh, so much. Um, I feel like that's a topic for three years of us of why do you like dwarves? You have to answer this question before you join our team anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in some ways, I think the thing that I like about the dwarves is, is, is what we really tried to highlight in the game, which is kind of what you were saying. It's this dichotomy of go out, adventure, uh, be heroic, and then come back and have a party. Um, you know, have a drink, sing a song, dance. Um, and it's it's like a back and forth we don't get to see uh, super often, especially in games. That's been really fun to bring to life. For me, just personality-wise, what I think of is the, the, the tough exterior, but but warm, caring interior, you know, like that, you know, just in terms of their personality, right? Like they're, they're, they'll be gruff and, and and tough and stern with you, but they care. Um, yeah, they're the, dwarves are the people that you would call uh, if you were stuck at the airport at midnight in the rain. They'll come and pick you up. They'll chew you out for it, but they, they love you and they want to take care of you. And that's the thing I like bringing to life. Yeah, absolutely. I think dwarves are just so much more relatable. <clears throat> like, I feel like the elves personally would make me feel bad all the time. Like, I'm not being a good enough person or doing enough of the right thing. And I don't think the dwarves usually make you feel bad. They want a lot of the same things that I want, which is just like comfort and a reasonable amount of wealth and to get rid of the bad guys. So, I don't know. They, they, they're just much more relatable than most of the other characters uh, in Lord of the Rings, I think. It's kind of fun to speculate what a survival crafting game centered on elves would be. Uh, I personally think it might end up being pretty boring. They would just be like, I'm never hungry and I'm never thirsty. And there's a thing I need to do and I will just magically craft an awesome thing that does it. <laughs> so uh, it wouldn't you wouldn't have the struggle you would with uh, some of the more, quote, human of the the uh, the peoples of Middle Earth. There's like no hunting. There's no sickness. They probably never get poisoned. <laughs> No, what you only we... pick leaves. Yeah, uh, it would have to be like an escort quest game. You're like, keep the humans alive, um, keep the hobbits alive. That'd be fun. Uh, Make them feel bad. Yeah, move, move, moving on. I mean, when, one of the other things that uh, Bradley talks about is uh, looking for um, concept artists that could help us flesh out what the orcs look like, and, and talking about finding Tim McBurney and his original. Uh, original work that really was inspiring. One thing that I wanted to mention there is, as we talked about what do we want the orcs to look like, and really what do we want the visual style to look like with the orcs in particular, we kept coming back to 
the 70s and early 80s vibe of fantasy as um, in some ways typified by the Bakshi films and the Bakshi animation. Obviously, we don't look like a Bakshi film, but wanting to get a little bit of that. And you can see that if you really ever find a way to, to capture an image of a goblin close up, you, you can see the sort of exaggerated proportions of them, um, which is also something that, that Bradley talks about um, with when he talks about after the exploration, we sort of landed on the long arms, the torso, the the stumpy and the misshapen legs. Ty, I wonder if you could talk about what it's like to, to from an artist's perspective, modeling and um, a creating a, a character with those kind of proportions. For sure. Um, yeah, those concepts, just to start off with, are amazing and totally got me excited when I first started seeing them roll roll in um and i think a lot of the decision making too with with having stumpier legs was because our posed and animated orcs we knew were going to be sort of like in this half squat uh position even when they're running at you and or just staying static and with longer legs or even more proportionate legs we're you know they might get in the way when they're running after you in this squat position. So making them less obvious, shorter, and more um, more attention on the longer gangly lunging of arms and slashing of arms, uh, I think makes it more scary. But, but yeah, totally. Um, when you're making these characters, you have to really pay mind to the proportions and silhouette. Um, so you can get it as close as you can to the concept. Um, yeah. What, what do you think was interesting about um, the the 3D models and, and eventually getting them onto screen? Like, what what was fun about working on the the works for you, Ty? Oh, there was the challenges of it, right? So there's like we needed to share. I think it it might have said in the blog where. You know, we wanted to share the same skeleton just to uh, reduce the amount of work going into it. Um, so maintaining the same skeleton silhouette and proportions, but trying to make them look different. And uh, we had a system where we're just kind of, you know, we would add different types of armor pieces, um, bracers, shin guards, uh, shoulder armor, helmets. Um, just to try and add that variety, even though we're, you know, we're sharing the same skeleton amongst all these different types of orcs. Um, we cut them up so we can share different heads. Um, some even have different legs. So that was a challenge, just making sure that we had the variety and we had a system in place that, uh, that can be mismatched and, and look different. I just want to jump in and say that I feel like that that is one of our my my favorite successes we had because those you know like you said all the orcs share a skeleton they share a lot of animations so I I've always really impressed by the fact that I can see a native orc or goblin and go yep I know what that is and I can see the red eyes and see how much like more armored and intimidating they look or how the Gundabads like just feel really really different. Um, just from the, the couple of really smart swaps we're making on that end. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And, uh, um, you know, probably one of my favorite things orc wise is to go from the deeps up to, uh, you know, you do your thing. And, and sorry, this is spoilers, uh, up to Dwaro Delph and to see the difference between the orcs. They feel very different. You know, you have the sort of mangy looking, like, you know, just barely hanging on orcs. They're still dangerous. And then you have the fully armored and they look almost like walking tanks, but it's still the same rig and everything. I think it was really, really fun thing for me, especially as I'm doing my own solo playthrough now that the dust is settled and stuff and I'm getting some time to experience it was a really fun just juxtaposition. Well, it was fun while we were developing as well, because like Ty said, they created a lot of different like pieces of orcs. And then we had what we called the orc creator, where when an orc gets spawned, we grab a lot of those pieces and we stick them together uh, to make the final orc. And so they can look very different. But when we were beginning, before all those pieces got created, you would end up 
fighting a lot of like cookie cutter versions of the same orc. And then as the art team started to like put in all those different pieces, you would start a horde like the next day and all the orcs would look a little bit different. Um, so it was really fun to watch all that come in and how quickly we could have new orcs uh, just because of that system and the way the art team worked. It's kind of, it's funny. It reminds me of like some of the bugs that can happen with the system and how <laughs> the, the orcs, like I said, were are kind of like in this hunched over squatting position, but then sometimes we would accidentally an Uruk skeleton would get placed in uh, with orc pieces and they're like fully stretched out having Uruk animations and just kind of not really working with the pieces that we built. Um, so that type of stuff happens quite a bit. Yeah, we should, but we there should. were issues with um, like the heads being assigned. And so there was a, a while during dev where like you would get chased by headless Goblin men a lot. I don't really know what happened there, but we fixed that. Headless guys. Uh, or when that was the, a delightful period of development. When the Troll King never had a head. Uh, still got some yeah. Of the Troll King. Um, oh. Yeah, we should we should dig up some of the old... Uh, I bet we have screenshots of some of those uh, weird things. Uh, that would be Like a sure. blooper reel? Yeah. Uh, I was going to... Because I saw it come up from uh, uh, Baytran70 uh, talking about orcs fighting trolls and stuff. And if you guys don't mind, I was going to talk real quickly about the first time we got that working together. I, I remember we were in the office for for a company summit. And Jeannie, you had just gotten the troll working with... And, and Ty, you had, had done a lot of work to make the troll like freeze in the, in the sun and stuff. And so we were all playtesting together in one of the conference rooms. It was the first time we got to see in order trolls fighting orcs player jumps in starts the uh, uh, troll fighting an orc uh, uh, fighting a, a, a group of orcs player jumps in starts to fight them and then kites the troll into the sun and it was great because there were like 10 people in the room together we all burst out cheering when all the systems worked just as we expected it was like the raddest thing so yeah, that, that was a okay, go ahead John Paul no please I was going to say that feature, I mean, I, f I find it transformative to the game. And it was one that I, I think almost didn't make the cut because we were just kind of down to the wire when yeah. we got it in. And I, I think GD with single minded determination was like, no, this will be awesome. Uh, and, and it truly was. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I'd wanted it from the beginning. Like even when I'd been playing the, together the systems, I was like, one day everything's gonna fight each other because that's like how it should go lore wise etc mm -hmm. um and really really wanted to turn it on <laughs> before well, it was launched it was this you know i think we had a lot of problems in early development because we were we had it on really early and then right. we had to turn it off because then everything was killing each other before you got there. <laughs> yeah, we'd, yeah get, we'd, like, we'd be playing and we'd get to Gundabad and be like, Michael, Jeannie, why are there no orcs in... Uh, not in Gundabad, excuse me. That's a, that's a spoiler. Um, we would get to uh, the Desolation, um, which we've called three different things, so hopefully I'm calling it the right thing, um, in and around Durin's Forge. And it would be like, Michael, Jeannie, why are there no orcs here? And then we'd check the logs and be like, oh, no, they were all here. They just killed each other before you got past the bridge uh, yeah so. yeah or they like there you'd have empty camps in the beginning of the game and we're like I, I swear i'm spawning them i know i'm spawning them and then they would have like seen a deer and like chased a deer off into the distance and just emptied out the camp or and there were no deer because like the wolves were <laughs> eating all the deer. the deer yeah or in the rats so you know we ended up putting in a lot more i think you, you the team system you put in and it's just like no one chases a deer they're just they're gonna, leave the deer gonna, alone. they're gonna leave the deer alone they have food it's cooking at their camps it's good uh yeah. and so we kind of filtered it down to the scenarios that would actually kind of make sense and be fun to see and then also did a lot of work to be like and they don't do it until you're close by <laughs> Uh, uh yeah in my um obviously we've all played through the game a bunch uh but i started my daughter really wanted to play uh together on on ps5 so we, we started a new game and we were i think just a couple of days ago we had built up a new camp in the in the mines of moria and we built it up there was a um there was an ore region that we had cleared out. And so we built it kind of up. It's a like way up there. And we built all these little platforms to get up there. And we managed to uh, create a base that was hanging off of the cliff wall. 
that the orcs, when they siege, can't get to us. And so we'd get the siege notification, and then my daughter would be like, don't worry, they can't get to us. And we would look way downward, and we would see the orcs, and they're just randomly smashing stuff, like angry, they can't get to us. And then we saw this one goat just start to wander in, and we're like, no, goat, what are you doing? Don't do that. My daughter was so mad. She was like hoping that the goat was going to get by without the orcs noticing them. Uh, And then sadly, the orcs did notice the poor goat. Uh, she was upset, but I was happy that that was free hide. I could jump down there and get. That was a fun, fun story. Uh, so <laughs> why don't we move uh, moving into into the blog? Um, the one of the next things that that Bradley starts to talk about is the different orc tribes, and this is something I think would be fun to talk about. Uh, you know, with the with us really wanting to feel accurate and thinking about. A lot of our debate from the lore side is what's going on with the orcs now. And uh, so starting with the first one of the native orcs, we knew we wanted you to get a classic orc pretty early. And and Mateo concepted these, um, what we call the Moria orcs or the quote native orcs. These would be the orcs that you see in, in the, or that you would read about in the Hobbit, the Misty Mountain orcs, the ones that were there during the War of Orcs and Dwarves. Um, Azog's clan, and and you get that when you eventually get to Bulgak. And so these were would have been in our time period in the Fourth Age, uh, or going back before the War of the Ring, these would have been the ones that pretty much fully owned Moria. Uh, these would have been the ones that uh, the, the Fellowship would have run into, or some amount of them. And then our idea is you get a little further in, and you start to meet some of the other orcs, uh, creating a, that conflict uh, of why they fight. Uh, so the idea was that the Moria orcs were there, Mordor falls, the Red or Red Eye orcs, or the basically the armies of Sauron, the ones that survive. Figure, what do we do now? And this was one of our one of our concepts was this isn't the first time they've all rallied around a Dark Lord and the Dark Lord fell. And so from them, they're like, ah, d- Dark Lords come and go, but the orcs are forever. We just got to go hide in a mountain for a while until another one shows up. And, and so the idea was they'd be like, well, where do we go? Well, let's go to Moria. And so they they show up with all their armor and uh, military tactics and push out the uh, the Moria orcs, the ones that didn't answer Sauron's call and join the army. And so that was a lot of what you hear when you encounter the early orcs in the game is them talking about, we got pushed out, you know, we're going to we're going to take it back someday and, and spoiler you kind of keep them from doing that so that's that's the native orcs uh, one of the ones that the the early ones that that you jump in and start fighting right away i think there is some uh, that's actually uh, one of my favorite uh Kuzdul lines is uh, only orc only good orc is a dead orc um then we get into goblin men and and anybody Wait, feel free to quiz, jump do you in. remember how to say it in Kuzdul? Oh, I don't have Farah here. She's the one that that is very good at the pronunciation. Um, I can barely pronounce English. Um, Just while and, and, while you're yeah. on the topic of Kuzdal there, sorry, um, someone had asked in the chat um, about the inspiration behind it and what you're using to translate the phrases. That's a great question. Um, when we started the project, we we set out to say, well, we'll just go grab one of the open dwarf language and we'll just license it or something and then it, we realized we're like oh no there's like one sentence of it and so we went digging around and we, we actually had some help from uh, our friends at middle earth entertainment who connected us with david sallow um who is a, a professor in the midwest here in the u.s um, and he wrote um he helped the Peter Jackson movies by writing the versions of of Cinderin, um, and, um, uh, the high elf language and uh and the dwarvish for the hobbit m- movies and so um, obviously like we couldn't use those but he helped us invent a, a new version and really kind of flesh it out and so we have what he did was he wrote up a rules for translating he wrote up a 900 word lexicon including prefixes suffixes uh, ways to construct words uh, and then he translated he actually himself translated the voiceover script now for for time and cost reasons we really wanted to record the entire voiceover script uh, in Kuzdul, uh, but it ended up being unfortunately cost prohibitive uh, maybe that's something in the future that i'd love to try to do again uh, but so we had we picked sort of the important rule 
important phrases. So that's that's why you would notice when you make a a orc or not an orc, excuse me, when you make a dwarf uh, and it says favors Kuzduel, and part of that is we wanted to record the important ones, but uh, we also. If an orc is talking to, if a, a dwarf is talking to an orc, he's not going to speak in Kuzduel. They only speak to each other in Kuzduel. They don't even speak to the raven in, in Kuzduel. Uh, so he translated all of those and then he gave us a pronunciation guide and he recorded himself um, speaking all of the voice lines. And so that and then we were able to use that as a guide for the voice actors who, who recorded Kuzduel. So I have a... I have a lot of information that when I go, we need a new phrase. The first is, did David translate it? Because if David translated, it's a really good translation. Uh, and then if I translate it, um, that I do my best. Um, and so some, a lot of those phrases that we share out are ones straight from, from David Sallow. Uh, and then I, I used it to flesh out a couple of things in there. And we are talking about potentially doing a pronunciation guide, perhaps even an interview with David to talk about the creation of the language. And he and I have actually often talked about how can we get this out to everybody so everyone can use it. I think we both have a lot of, uh, and Middle Earth Entertainment have a lot of interest in how do we how do we make it public. It's uh, unfortunately with all things in the world today with content, uh, it's not a straightforward, just put it out kind of thing. But that is something we are talking about doing. Awesome. Thank you for, for answering. Sorry to interrupt if you want to get back to your, your list of orcs and goblins. No, that's a good one. Um, yeah, and, and team, feel free to jump in uh, as we talk about the different ones, even if you've got fun experiences with, with each of the different. Uh, yeah, well, orcs. yeah, go ahead. I was, gonna, I was just going to add that, like, the, the Kuzdil and, and, and sort of English speaking uh, um, characters, if you have a multiplayer game, is kind of my favorite thing because it sets up sort of a Chewbacca Han Solo relationship. Even though they're all dwarves and stuff, I like the sort of interplay uh, of seeing the Kuzdil uh, and then English response and vice versa is, is super fun to me. Yeah, in fact, we, we, um, that was one of the things that made us feel comfortable with the mixed stuff. We, we talked about like, if I want to hear the game in Kuzdal, would I hear everybody talking? And we realized it was a lot more fun if I make an orc and I use the English VO and you make an orc and use the Kuzdal VO. Uh, and it, I actually think it's fun to then turn off the subtitles. Um, so you get a bit of the, um, Chewbacca Han Solo moments of uh, your your dwarf knows what your friend just said, but you may maybe don't know. Uh, so m moving moving to the next kind of arc, which is the Goblin Men of of Isengard. Uh, these are the ones you primarily see in the Elven Quarter. Uh, these were inspired by two particular sections in the book. Uh, the the biggest one is a uh, tree beard in the Two Towers. Um, Treebeard in the Two Towers describes um, what um, what Sauron has been doing. Excuse me. And uh, there's also a bit of a reference to maybe the the Southerner that shows up in Bree is, is one of these. And so we kind of asked ourselves, like, if if uh, Sauron made all these guys and they survived into the Fourth Age, they they wouldn't be like going and starting a farm somewhere. Uh, and so we we have our own kind of um, history of them of some of them staying violent and living in the woods and some of them trying to assimilate and eventually getting pushed out and, and figuring same as the red eye, where do I go? And they go to Moria and then realize they're not full orcs. So they can't live in the complete dark. And they realize that the other orcs don't really like the elven area because of the elven magic and it's bright. And so that's the one little corner they can kind of make their own. Um, I don't know if anybody has any fun experiences uh, working on or playing uh, in that area with the goblin men. I think it was, uh, one of the few times we were, we would play test and breach into the elven quarter. And, uh, up until that point, we were just fighting, you know, goblins. It was really early. And then, uh, you would see one of these huge, uh, goblin men out in the distance and it was just the most intimidating thing because that was the first real big enemy i think that we had we had seen at that point um and they would just wreck us it was, it was awesome yeah. i i remember when we first turned them on it, it was in a different form because we didn't really have camps yet 
so they were just wandering and we also hadn't really tuned sound and how much people how how much or how far away goblins goblins and orcs could detect you so you would breach the elven quarter go whoa and then like like terminator coming out of the woods there were just these gray mesh Uruk uh, models that would just swarm you in the most inti- I think that might still be one of the most intimidating moments I've had played the game. Uh, it was great. Yeah, that was something well, weird. And the, Go ahead, Jeannie. These are the ones that always never have never had heads. These are the ones that always lock their heads. <laughs> yeah. This headless T one thousand's coming at you in your Lord of the Rings game. Yeah, and Baytran, I totally agree with you. Uh, they, I love the Goblin Men also, and and we are uh, as a team talking about how to use them a bit more. Um, you know, when we when we conceived of, you know, were trying to think about like a when when would you breach into the Elven Quarter? How long would it take you in Westgate? And one of the things that was important, I think, for both Bradley and I, was with a third person game. How do we reinforce that the dwarves are not human sized? And that's why we wanted to try to get enemies that were taller than you uh, but we want to start early in the game with enemies that are i i level with the dwarves and then eventually so that idea of oh these guys are these guys are human size they're they're bigger um so that that was one of the important things with the goblin men but yeah i agree we we want to try to figure out how we can use them again use them a little bit more especially as we start doing things that will hopefully make the game either easier or harder I, I joined after the uh, headless gray uh, goblin men uh, era, but uh, you know to to breach the first few times and see this beautiful landscape, and then be like, oh, they, they're they're even here, and wait, they're different. They're actually upright. They feel more dangerous to me. Uh, was was a really fun experience to have, and and then also figuring out that you can run a bear through them is uh, is great too. Kite a bear, bring it along, and then get some free resources from trees too. I was gonna say, drag that bear through the trees. That are copping down every every elven wood tree. Yeah, easiest easiest way to get elven wood um, if you can keep the bears alive. Uh, and then also, uh, we never quite got in that that thing that I wanted, which was uh, uh, for the lore people debating who the bears are. Uh, but uh, we never never quite got to that. Maybe in the future. Uh, so m- moving forward, as we get into the the deep orcs, this was where. You know, you've gone down again. Spoilers for everybody who hasn't gotten too far in. Um, you know, you've gone down the crystal descent, and you get down into the wet areas. Um, you know, the differentiating the deep orcs from the other orcs. Uh, these are almost kind of like the the prepper orcs. These are the ones that have been. They've been so far down in the dark. They they probably don't even know what what it's like in the upper areas anymore. Um, and we want to try to make them feel yeah a little bit more savage, a little bit more feral. Uh, we even debated at some point if they would even have an orc town or would they just have like a big warren. Um, and for time's sake, they have an orc town. But uh, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts or fun stories about the the deep orcs. I mean, I'd like to hear actually from Ty if you have any talk about when you modeled these, because the concepts are very cool, but the models that we ended up with are actually like way creepier than even the concepts have. They've got like, they're like the fungus goblins. Oh, uh, yeah, the the goblins, the goblins and the the deep orcs. um, Yeah, like we had just mentioned, they're they're getting less light. they are more pale. Um, one of the interesting things, too, that when you get a concept, uh, that's what it is. It's a concept, but it's part of our job to make them 3D, make make uh, make them more real. Um, and sometimes you have to. Sometimes even in the concept, you don't even see like what's what do they look like from the back? What do they look like from the side? So you have to sort of make educated decisions um but yeah like for those types and the concepts for the the goblins um they do have fungus growing on them and that was a really really nice uh exercise in uh in modeling um and kind of like a a cool knot to like the last of us and that sort of deal it's like it's like orcs have a diet of cordyceps 
I see that every once in a while. Like you go to like a a, a fancy grocery store and they'll have like a, some kind of vitamin pill and on it says cordyceps. And I'm like, I've played too much Last of Us to buy something that has cordyceps in it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Shout out, to, shout out to Neil, my old classmate, who made those games. Um, so then the red, we get into the red eye orcs. Now the red eye orcs, I think, were the ones that we we debated: should the game start with the red eye orcs or should they be? And we decided we really wanted to armor them up, and we wanted to put them a little bit later. And um, this was the one where we we often joked about one of the voice lines we talked about is like, should they should they be talking a lot about like, yeah, Sauron's not dead. That's just elven lies um and so the, the, these were the ones we had fun with and big banners and the idea that they had taken over the second hall um which is another reason like once you come up the eastern stairs and you get to the bridge of kaza doom well there you are you're right you should be able to just walk right into to dwaradelf and that's where we thought well that would be a really great place to put a giant menacing orc town and every once in a while like when we were playing um you go oh look at this big wooden barrier let me just break this and you hit it hit it hit it and then you open up and you're like oh i shouldn't have done that because <laughs> there you found the red eyes um so w with these guys you know they're the michael and genie i mean one of the things that we had to do with the combat system was make it feel like why would you need a different weapon why would you need to to deal with these guys that are armored in a different way i don't know if there's something you want to talk about there Well, I, you know, I would say the we we wanted them to just be probably the most intimidating of the the orc enemies you fought at least up to that point, and for for most of the game, I, I think the the shadow orcs at the end probably take the cake in in the in the long run. Mm -hmm. But um, I think more than any other enemy, we really just wanted that feeling of oh man. My hits are not doing much. I really need to get better weapons. And and that's the tier of weapons that take the most work to get because you have to build the new better forge. You have to um, go find the gold, get the better pickaxe for that. So it, it's a big, long ramp. But um, I actually think one of the, the most fun things was kind of nailing the enemy placement and level design of the, of the Red Eyes in Dwaradelf. Um, because uh, it was almost a happy accident that the way the camp logic worked out and the way the, that level spacing worked out is we got them on these somewhat predictable patrol routes, which uh, has... I, I don't know if other people play this way, but I almost Metal Gear Solid my way through that area every time I get there so I can go start finding the gold, find my little outposts that I can keep secret and safe so I can just build up my power before I even try to fight any of those camps and then I go on a warpath. Yeah, those Elder Game orcs are, are an interesting one. You know, I mean, we just for time i'm seeing where we're at so i'm, I'm going to skip the good to bad orcs now although those are fun to watch the two of them uh fight and we have a little story there of good to bad and um there's a couple of really minor references you'd have to really be be paying attention to get the what some of the underlying fiction of where is uh where is king thor and at the time of the story going on and the idea that um Gimli is is actually distracting from King Thorin because he felt like the best thing for him to do was to go and and make war on Gundabad, uh, Mount Gundabad, which is where where the first Durin actually awoke and the orcs had taken it over as a stronghold, and that's why the word Gundabad is often associated with with orcs. And so uh, King Thorin in our time period and in the Fourth Age has decided to cleanse the northern Misty Mountains of the orcs. And so he's up there doing this big orc campaign. Meanwhile, Gimli's like, I'm going back to Moria. And then they, the two cousins argue, uh, argue about that. And so the idea is that these guys were basically pushed out and have been just raiding up and down Middle Earth along the Misty Mountains and probably on their way further south uh, at this point and went in and said, oh, let's just go into Moria, get some supplies. And then, uh, you know, unfortunately for them, got stuck inside Moria like everybody else when the the curses went up. Um, so that's that's a little little fun backstory about the Gundabads. And then when we get to the final orcs, the shadow orcs, um, these were an interesting ones because we were like, how do we we've we've raised up the orcs? They're big, they're tall, they're mostly Uruks now. They're big and armored from the red eye. 
how do we make them even more fearsome? And uh, so we, we we took some inspiration from the orcs chanting gosh, uh, gash from um, the orcish language um, for meaning fire, um, which means that they were in thrall with the Balrog. And so we thought, well, what would have happened to those uh, those orcs in the fourth age. And so we like the idea of them being enthralled to the shadow now, um, as opposed to the fire. And that's, that's why sometimes you get both of those words to describe them, uh, to try to make them fearsome, to throw shadow at you at the end. And man, in the end game, if you, if you haven't piled up all of your anti shadow, uh, buffs, um, it can, it can make the end game very hard. Um, any thoughts on those guys before, and then that's, we're getting close to the end of the, into the blog post now. I mean, they're creepy. It's successfully creepy, I think. <laughs> yeah, they they totally became my favorite orc, um, especially when we got them integrated into the game uh, and and roaming around the environment, attacking you with their their wards. They just have a, a completely different look to them. And they stand out. They also have a different sound. I like the way that the voice actors for the Shadow Orcs in particular ended up ended up doing that performance. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the questions I was going to ask you guys is, um, do you have a, a favorite orc out of all of them? Can can you choose a favorite orc? <laughs> can I be snarky and say that one at launch day that uh, just did nothing but that weird ass scream over and over again <laughs> that we... Oh very very quickly fixed and patched <laughs> out <laughs> he was my not favorite orc uh, for anyone who played shout out to anyone who played the very first pre-patched version on october 24th because uh, that one had a goblin that was like Wah! all the time uh yeah okay maybe someone should give a real answer to that question then. <laughs> i like yeah i'm like gonna talk about the ones that i don't like I like the Gundavads. They look so different and burly, and they have pet wolves, and that's cool. Orcs. They have pet orcs, and that's cool. <laughs> My favorite orc is whichever one ends up with the... I don't even know if it's like a back piece or, or a shoulder piece, but it's got a dwarf skull hanging, and it's still got the beard, um, which is very yeah, upsetting and that's it's in, a, a, in a great way. That's a deep orc. They have that, that backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of wolves real quick uh, uh i think it was yesterday actually um i was in the kitchen doing something and my, my daughter scared me from behind and i turned around and she was like i'm just like the wolves in the elven quarter <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah i was like okay all right, all right, all right. <laughs> they do sneak up on you they do sneak up on you they um, do. quite the lid that well, Claire, we got um, we got about ten minutes left. Uh, happy to, uh, and I think we've pretty much gotten to the the end of everything we wanted to talk about um, mm -hmm. from the blog post. So obviously, Bradley's not here. Thank you to Bradley for for writing that up and describing it. And and we've got uh, plans to do more of these, release a blog, and then get the team together to answer questions and and talk about it. But uh, Claire, if you wanted to, if there's any any questions from the chat um, or general community questions that we haven't gotten to. Um, well, there's one from uh, Knox that I thought was interesting. I don't know if this is going to be something that Bradley covers in the future, but um, they were wondering about the the designing of trolls, like particularly like when it comes to the animations of them, because they are again another different shape, and then also where those designs came from. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that would be a question for Bradley, unless Ty, you've got you've got some thoughts on that. Um. Yeah, I would. I would prefer Bradley go into that more. Um, yeah, yeah. That might be the, maybe next time we have Bradley around to chat, or if he's writing another blog, we could ask him to to dip into that. Yeah, I, ha I have to say one of my favorite things is when you breach and you see just in the far off distance fog, you see the outline of a troll. Um, that that is pretty fun for me. But a great question. Uh, yeah, let's let's figure out how we can get Bradley to talk more about the trolls. Um, I have a actually one that I thought of myself um, while you guys were chatting. Um, 
especially when like uh you have all the the enemies fighting each other at times and stuff i've seen members of the community who occasionally mention that they've they've kept pets which is like enemies that they've boxed in um <laughs> to kind of stand in the way of hordes coming did you expect that players would do that or did you even try it yourselves when you were playing or what do you think of that uh, what do you think team any thoughts on that one I love that and it makes me so happy and I didn't think of it and I probably should have but the first time you told me that players had built their base like behind a bear camp so that the bear could protect them from sieges uh I was really happy it was yeah it, it exactly what Jeannie said not not we didn't expect it as soon as I heard it I was like oh my god of course and also that's amazing <laughs> I went did it myself after I heard it, and and it it, it worked fantastically, right? Like just you, you, it it was great to just sit on a balcony and watch these orcs get demolished by by a bear. Mm -hmm. Even now um, in the mines, I just wait for a, a bear to spawn uh, on a patrol, and I'm like, all right, now we're gonna go take out the camp. Let's go. <laughs> it, do, it does make me think about the first time we saw a tester fight the troll king in a very Fortnite style which we thought maybe would be something people would do, but sat there and basically just built up walls very quickly around him and then just pelted him with uh, with arrows. And we were like, should we do something about this or should we let it happen? And we we're like, oh, let's let it happen. Uh, so. uh, no, I worked on trying to fix that for like two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, and then and we then were like, we, yeah, decided. we decided not to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> After two weeks. <laughs> I think I've also seen a community member who built, I can't, forgive me if you're here, I can't remember your name, um, but they built a labyrinth in the game, like with walls and everything, and um, they alluded to that they had trapped some creatures in there, so if anyone was going through the labyrinth, it was kind of like, you might find a minotaur type energy to it, oh, which I thought was that, really, could, really cool. Could you cut a video of that so we could see it? That sounds awesome. I'd love to see that. I'll try and, and search back through and find their username so I can I can reach out to them. And, and I think just yeah. generally that that's one of the most fun things you know as, as we're watching you guys play is to just see the emergent gameplay that that comes up stuff that we wouldn't have thought of that you guys do is is really really a delight to see. I I it's like my high is is seeing those things happen. Um, I have a, another question here from uh, Shakespeare Mint, which that's the username that I absolutely love. Um, has the team kept everything as close as possible to the books or have you taken inspiration from other dwarven cultures and well, as well? Like they mentioned um, Dragon Age, but I suppose there's like a lot of hmm. like historical myths and legends that um, dwarves come from as well. So is there any of that that you leaned on? And that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, for for those of you in the community who've been following our, our other interviews and and talks, we've always were tried to stay as close to the books as possible. Excuse me, um, and that was really really important to us. So, you know, but we know that people come in with their own expectations, I and mean, we've got we've got some pretty heavy Warhammer players. I love Dragon Age, um, anything dwarf. Uh, I, I love to interact with, uh, but. We, I mentioned this, I think last summer, you know, we, one of our values in our team was always asking ourselves whenever we invented something uh, to be able to reference, where did we pull this from in the book? Now that did get a little difficult when we realized there was almost no physical descriptions of the, the orcs uh, as Bradley talks about. So we, I, I would say we stayed close to the book, but it, it is impossible to, to, fully pull out your own influences because everyone's got their own life experience. And uh, so uh, everyone kind of has their own point of view on what, what a dwarf is and what it should be. So uh, there's probably a little bits in there from influences, just as we are people that consume lots of media and play lots of games, uh, but try to stay as close to the books as we could. Yeah, I can imagine that would have been quite difficult at the start with everyone calling everyone else up on things like, nope, can't do that. <laughs> that that's from something else. That's that's not Tolkien. Someday we need to uh, uh, maybe we do a little video of just Bradley, uh, our art director, and Eric, who is here, um, our director of production, uh, can just show off all of the minis that they paint 
Uh, it's it's pretty incredible stuff. Oh when have, yeah. When you have game yeah. game artist experienced people painting minis, you, you, they're they're pretty. I've got one uh, uh, Eric painted for me of a dwarf right next to me. It's it's pretty pretty incredible. Yep. No, I, I I really appreciate it. Just a fun uh, side story. When I was interviewing for the job, I, so this is uh, my week, my year anniversary this week. Um, I had a great conversation with Bradley. It was supposed to be half an hour as I was interviewing. It ended up being an hour. And then at the end, he's like, oh, well, what do you do for fun? I was like, oh, I paint miniatures. And my icon is one of the minis I painted. And he's like, hang on a second. He turns off his background, and it's just a full miniature painting setup. He's got an airbrush, and the paint's nicely organized. I was like, we're going to get along great. Yeah. Yeah, he'll have to show that <laughs> up. I'm seeing a couple of people call the the Dia Moon the, the pig things, um, which is funny because for a very long time, uh, the internal team just called them uh, the pig badger boars. Uh, <laughs> I kept yeah. describing, I was like, we need, we need something in the ecosystem that kind of fits this. What would they be? And I was like, we need something that's just like this, like underground pig badger boar. And somebody picked up on that and we just kept calling them pig badger boars forever. And then eventually when David Salo came on, we were like, can you help us name, <laughs> name this creature? <laughs> um, and we had a couple different names, like Griveling for a while. Uh, and that one kind of rolls off the tongue, but ultimately we decided for the direct interpretation uh, that, that he wrote up, which is, I think, um, uh, digging animal. It's like digging animal in the dark. And that's what Diamond and then Ben moon is like a, a modifier that makes it small. Um, well, so uh, I may, I may, go ahead. I was going to say they may or may not still be pig badger boar in a couple of places in the config. <laughs> There's definitely pig badger, <laughs> pig, pig badger yeah. boars in my heart forever. And and because that, uh, Zach B brought it up. I... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, do you want to talk about snack rats? I still can't believe I named them that and no one stopped me. <laughs> I, I really was like, Bradley is going to be like, you can't call them snack rats. Uh, because uh, Michael, you and I were talking about how are people going to know that the rats are what they should eat early in the game? And I was like, oh, <laughs> we'll just call them snack rats and then everyone will know there's food. And then it stayed. And then there was a point, I think it was like maybe a month before launch when I was like, Oh man, I have this like to-do list note of come up with a better name for snack rat and then never did never did it. So so for the people that love this name snack rats, you're welcome for the people that I roll at it. I'm sorry. Uh, so <laughs> they're so adorable as well. Like we shared a, a TikTok video at one stage of like the animation where they're like just cleaning their face. It's like, oh, you're so lovely, but I'm about to eat you. Um yeah, and and I I will share the chat uh, desire to um, have pets of all the animals. That is uh, a fun idea. We all want pets. It's well, true. we had this problem. I feel like we have this problem on the team, which is every time we had new concept art or a new model of uh, um, not the orcs, but of the 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 fauna in the game. Uh, we're like, this is great. Look at this deer. You're going to be able to hunt it for meat and hide. And Michael and I are super excited. It's filling out a part of the core game loop of the game. And then everyone on the team is like, oh, I don't want to kill that. <laughs> so we're, they're really pretty. The deer, we, especially we, like, <laughs> I think the only animal, we, the only like, like non orc we made that people were like, oh, I'm not messing with that was probably, uh, one of the, the unnamed uh creatures which which by the way if, in case anyone's curious the the nameless beasts um in in our mind that's just the first nameless beast um that there's going to be others but they're all nameless so we couldn't give it a name even if there's like five other eventual nameless beasts because then they wouldn't be nameless anymore so uh for anyone who are wondering Michael, you were going to uh, say something. I cut you off, and then we're hitting time. I think we're hitting time. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I we, I think we had, we debated, like, do we need to make these deer less majestic because no <laughs> one wants to hunt them? And I think we compromised at there's some without the really cool antlers. <laughs> For uh, which then everyone calls llamas. Llamas, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm like, what's the llama doing here? I'm like, oh boy. Well. I mean, and uh, uh, Michael's going to hate me, but um, if you didn't kill them, where would you get the hide? And man, I could use some more hide sources <laughs> in the game. Oh yeah, I got over feeling bad about killing the deer right about uh, when I needed more hide to build my freaking backpack. 
Yeah, the one time yeah. I killed a bear, I was like, oh man, I wanted more hide out of that to make it worth it. Um, but poor poor Michael, who has been the one who has been dealing with the economy and making it and tuning it and creating the core loops and stuff. Uh, I think he's had to suffer for years of uh, people like me and Jeannie and Eric playing the game and going like, Michael, why aren't there more cloth scraps? And then the next build, Michael, there's too many cloth scraps. And then, <laughs> so um, sorry, that's continuing, Michael, now in public. I'll, I'll never be free. It's okay. <laughs> oh. And unfortunately, speaking of, we are at time, and I, I literally do need Michael so that we can start talking uh, future things and future plans. Not just talking, continuing to build. We've got yes, uh, correct. We are for those of you who maybe missed the beginning. I know there were probably a lot of questions about, hey, when's the next update? What are the things we're going to look for? Um, look for more either an event like this or potentially something um, live on another platform. We'll tell you with plenty of time. We we have a lot that we're working on. Um, and uh, we, we've got updates coming, um, just not quite ready to show them and talk about them yet. Uh, but that will be that will be coming. So if anyone was was worried about it, we are coming. And please keep please keep the feedback coming. Um, not just tickets to customer support, but posts in the feedback and support. All of those locations, Claire, you could even say we're the best places. We absolutely do read those. Um, we read everywhere that people talk about the game. This, but Discord is going to be your best place for moderated uh, conversation there. So we we have updates. We are reading. Um, we are reading everything, and and we're we're working, uh, we're working every day to get out another update that that hopefully everyone is really going to enjoy. And and uh, honestly, thank you so much for showing up, uh, wanting to hear us uh, blabber on for for an hour, uh, and thank you for playing the game. Um, you know, this was something that we've we've put a lot into, and we think there's a lot a uh, lot more we could do to improve uh, the game and and make it even more fun for everybody. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thanks to everyone. Just then um, before we finish, I just wanted to reiterate there that like, um, if you have any any feedback or you've experienced any issues or things you'd like to see changed in the game, please use the support and feedback channel. Follow the link in there. That's the best way to get um, information directly to the team. And it's also a great way for us to kind of gauge the frequency of, um, of a request or an issue because um, we have metrics on that system. And also it means that we don't risk missing something in Discord. Like I, myself and the community team will always be checking through Discord and um, if something comes up, we'll, we'll keep a note of it. But but sending tickets in is is usually the best way to definitely ensure that it is being seen. Um, and I just want to to thank all of uh, Free Range for joining us today. Everybody, rock and stone, y'all! Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.